Great. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Sarah Anderson. I'm a senior research scientist at Child Trends, and we so appreciate your time today, or if you're watching this on video. Um, what I'm gonna do real briefly before we dive in is just to mention a couple of logistics about GoToWebinar. So you will automatically be muted for this session. Um, and during the Q&A portion, which we'll have about 10 to 12 minutes at the end, you can chat your questions in and then hopefully we'll have time to address some of those. And you can see the email address of Emily Fox at Child Trends if you should have any issues during, any technical issues during the session. But I am going to go ahead and without further ado, get started. So once again, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Today, we're going to be talking about service coordination to support the whole child. And so this will take a number of different forms today. We'll hear about school-based health centers and reproductive health and community schools. And I believe this is a timely topic uh, for School Health Week here at Child Trends, especially given our current um, pandemic. So what I'm going to do briefly is just introduce the rest of the panelists. And um, these are our lovely um, headshots here. I'm going to read some quick bios before we dive right in. So um, Janita Perrick is also a senior research scientist at Child Trends dedicated to implementing and evaluating evidence-based programs related to adolescent sexual health. She brings 10 years of experience conducting public health and social science implementation and evaluation re research specializing in qualitative and quantitative methods, particularly um, strengths in community-based participatory research. At Child Trends, she's the implementation evaluation, impact evaluation, and data collection lead for a randomized control trial of pregnancy prevention programs for young males. And prior to Child Trends, she was lead on an implementation science task force for statewide replication of evidence-based pregnancy prevention programs in New Jersey. We also have Paula Fields, who has over 20 years experience in school-based health center technical assistance and training, and she is Director of Programs and Consulting at the School-Based Health Alliance. She has a wealth of experience in building community partnerships, leading quality initiatives, and consulting nationally to promote plan and implement health and social supports, including school-based uh, services provided by the community. She recently served more than a decade on a board of directors for a federally qualified health clinic. She also has a diverse background in outpatient clinic administration, quality improvement, and grants management. And we have Sarah Jonas, who leads the school finance, school facing support and capacity building teams of the 267 community schools within Mayor de Blasio's New York City Community Schools Initiative, the largest community schools effort in the country. Sarah is chair of the Brookings Task Force on Next Generation Schools, which will create a roadmap for scaling community schools across America. A member of the class, ele class 11 of the Annie E. Casey Children and Family Fellowship, Sarah also served as an advisor to the Obama White House and the U.S. Department of Education National My Brother's Keeper Every Student Every Day campaign, a federal initiative dedicated to eliminating chronic absenteeism across 30 school districts. Prior to joining NYC DOE, Sarah served as a senior director of regional initiatives at Children's Aid National Center for Community Schools. And she is a certified teacher who taught in public elementary schools in Los Angeles and New York City. And finally, I am also a senior research scientist at Child Trends. For over 10 years, I've been conducting research on contexts such as schools and neighborhoods and policies, including pre-K and childcare that support children from diverse backgrounds. I'm a fellow of the Robert Wood Johnson Interdisciplinary Research Leadership Program and a co-lead a community-based participatory research project on school-based health centers in rural West Virginia. This work will inform approaches to delivering healthcare to children and families in rural areas of the U.S. I also am a co-principal investigator on the high school follow-up of the Tulsa, Oklahoma Pre-K study, one of the longest running studies of a school-based pre-K program. So those are our panelists for today. And in terms of our, what you can expect to hear about today, um, the first portion of the webinar, um, which um, will involve um, both presentations from myself and Janita, we will talk about models for school health coordination um, with a focus specifically on the COVID-19 context. And then Paula will be sharing some information about care coordination related to HIPAA and FERPA, 
And Sarah Jonas will close us out talking about community coordination with a community schools model. So I want to acknowledge um, in my portion of the presentation that um, I will be talking about um, school-based health centers and school health during COVID. And several of the slides also come from our wonderful partners at the School Health Alliance. Um, and Paula Fields was um, very instrumental in getting me these. And also I want to acknowledge the hard work of Aaron Sullivan and others at the School Health Alliance as well. So first of all, um, for just a brief overview in terms of what a school-based health center is, um, this is a definition, um, a, a concept that was shared with the School Health Alliance, saying that it's a shared commitment between a school community and healthcare organization to support students' health, well-being, and academic success by providing preventative early intervention and treatment services where students are in schools. Um, so as you hear a little bit about, this can take many different forms, but it does typically involve uh, either a permanent or a mobile clinic co-located at or close to schools that can enable access to various types of healthcare services um, look close to schools. And again, it does require um, this idea of commitment, um, I think is an important one because it does require a good deal of commitment and collaboration. And so briefly, I want to show, this comes from the School Health Alliance's um, biannual census, where they um, do get a count of the number of school-based health centers and the services provided. Um, importantly, this shows the growth of school-based health centers over the past couple of decades. Um, so we do see more schools choosing to um, make partner with um, health court organizations or others to enable access to school-based health centers. I'm going to pivot a little bit and show some of the work that I've done specific to West Virginia. Um, I don't anticipate everyone having their burning question being about West Virginia, but the slides really just show um, the important um, delivery and service mechanisms um, related to school health. And so what I want to show here is that school-based health centers um, include primary care, but they also can include things like mental and uh, mental health and um, dental services as well. So this demonstrates trends over time, over about the past decade, that were compiled um, from public reports here in West Virginia. And so what we see is that from 2012 to about 2020, um, that the number of school-based health centers also providing dental services has declined, although it's gone up and down a little bit in the past few years. Importantly, behavioral health services also are quite common um, in, in uh, school-based health centers. And we do see, again, there's been a bit of a wave pattern, but a, a little bit of an uptick recently in terms of those school health centers that also are providing those mental or behavioral health services. I also want to briefly mention, and many people are probably aware, that um, school-based health centers and certainly other um, services such as dental and behavioral health are not necessarily provided five days a week. Frequently, they are provided for a few days a week, especially the dental or behavioral health. It might be that those providers come in one or two days a week or a month to provide those services. Similarly, school-based health centers are not necessarily open um, every day of the week either. They do, um, you know, like many organizations, rely on that fee-for-service model. So it does depend a little bit on the population of the school along with other factors. I also want to stress that the population served can vary as well. So importantly, school-based health centers obviously provide services to the students in the schools. Um, they also can provide services to staff, and we see most of them in West Virginia do have made that commitment over the years, that yellow line. We also see that other students uh, within the community, such as at neighboring schools, can access school-based health centers. Similarly, families and other communities can access um, school-based health centers. A lot of models, several models in West Virginia and across the state actually co-locate clinics with schools, and the clinics actually have doors to the public that um, so that the public can enter so they don't go through the school. So it's kind of a co-location model there. That's why we do see about 20% of school-based health centers in West Virginia currently providing a community member access. Of course, um, we are all here on a webinar and a lot of the um, services additionally can be provided with telehealth services. That's something we'll be talking more about. Um, but even before the pandemic for services, particularly in rural areas, we did see the use of um, behavioral health in particular using telehealth to provide those services. 
So we're going to pivot a little bit now and focus on both some of the work that I've done and work by um, the Alliance in terms of suggesting the importance of school-based health centers and school health, especially during our current pandemic. So um, there, obviously, school-based health centers provide health care. We're in the middle of a public health crisis. There is a natural um, kind of uh, collaborative unity there between the school and the school-based health center to protect, potentially provide things, as we'll hear about screenings, potentially immunizations when those were allowed. School-based health centers often are a key platform to enable um, students to access and receive their annual immunizations. The COVID vaccine could be one of those as well. We also, it, we did interviews with a number of providers both before and after the pandemic and um, heard about things such as the importance of that warm handoff, the collaborative relationship between the school-based health center, those providers and the teachers is just so critical. And we believe that especially during this crisis that that relationship will be even more important because as we also heard, there are a number of um, you know, behavioral and mental health concerns facing um, students and staff right now. And so the ability for those teachers to be able to provide those referrals and that warm handoff right now could be critical. Um, in addition, there's the potential, especially as you know, schools open and close. I just got a text right now that my schools are closing tomorrow. As these things continue to be on flux, the role of the school-based health center in providing advice and expertise in this dynamic situation and and especially i believe when students you know they themselves are experiencing this stress the potential for those referrals especially around behavioral health could be critical so i'm pivoting now to share some slides um, that paula and colleagues shared about these listen, listening sessions they conducted with hundreds of school-based health centers during the early phases of the pandemic and they have some great lessons learned that we wanted to share. The first is launching and expanding telehealth is so critical. We know that school-based health centers typically are sponsored by organizations like federally qualified health centers, hospitals, or other organizations that often have telehealth services. The ability to launch and pivot and expand to those services is so critical right now. As I mentioned, we also have the potentially important role of COVID screenings. I, I, when we, I was interviewing one of our providers, she's in a rural school-based health center, and they do it all on site. And the, and the ability for the kids to you know, display symptoms, go to the clinic, get screened, be isolated, you know, that's a really critical role that they can play in kind of trying to shut down that transmission. As I also mentioned, there's just this important role of connecting caregivers with mental health and other social services in the community as well. You know, we know that their families are facing, you know, unemployment and food insecurity and other issues. And so those school-based health centers can really be a, an important hub. Uh, we also, uh, this, the Alliance heard about the partnering of school districts to make health information accessible, such as sharing newsletters, or having un other public health information that they share and send home. Uh, they heard of creating district-wide task forces to establish product protocol protocols and practices as well. And also training teachers in trauma-informed care and social determinants of health. You know, there are experts within those schools at school-based health centers that really can provide that critical expertise. You know, teachers are really, as we know, and, and so many people are doing the extraordinary right now. And having those um, additional experts um, that are affiliated and, and either co-located or, or just familiar with the school could be so critical to getting that information out there. We also know that um, they've provided some mental health summits with teachers and school administrators to um, enable um, you know, information sharing and those school um, teachers and school administrators to ask questions and just get that expertise in, in real time and as they need it. Um, and so um, I believe I'm on time, more or less. So I'm going to hand it over to my colleague now who's going to share some of her important learnings as well. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Uh, is there an echo at all? Okay, great. Um, so I am going to focus a little bit more on reproductive health. Um, and I also wanted to acknowledge the partnership that we have in this work with School Based Health Alliance as well. Uh, so the title of this is Strategies Providing School-Based Family Planning During COVID. Um, 
and Child Trends is currently partnering with School Based Health Alliance and conducting research to identify, evaluate, and disseminate successful strategies for providing family planning services to adolescents um, in school based settings. And so we were doing this before COVID hit, and then um, midway through data collection, um, COVID hit. And so we've, we've simultaneously also learned about strategies for um, during COVID. Um, and so what we're going to present today is the result of interviews we've done with various providers um, at school-based health centers and as well as the lit literature review that we did on successful family planning strategies. Uh, the literature review obviously wasn't um, the result of COVID, but we did feel like there were some strategies that we learned during the literature review that we thought could be really applicable in a COVID setting. So the strategies that I'm going to present today are kind of a blend of both, both the literature review and the interviews as well. So next slide. So um, as I mentioned, our goal is to identify and disseminate strategies. We're looking at strategies sort of in, from two different lenses. We're looking at family planning strategies uh, that will improve access to sexual reproductive health services. And we're looking at uh, family planning strategies that will improve the quality of uh, sexual reproductive health services. So as you can see here, they're just kind of a bunch of different graphics um, that sort of illustrate the different domains that we've looked at. Um, in terms of access, we have telehealth, mobile clinics, partnerships, on-campus contraception, on-campus STI testing, condom availability, and online contraception providers. Um, and then strategies for the quality uh, would be mobile apps, peer education, um, texting, and modifying services and wraparound services. Um, this, these are obviously the larger goals. And then what we did is kind of drill it down to, to look at what would be really relevant in this COVID climate. So the six strategies um, that I'll present are, are um, a lot more drilled down than what you see here. Next slide. So we'll go ahead and just sort of start presenting them. Um, so one of the biggest challenges to providing remote school-based family planning services is to really ensure that students, um, especially the new students, that they know that family planning services and providers are available to them. Um, and school-based health centers, they may commonly rely on foot traffic or these casual interactions in the hallways to really connect with students and advertise these services. And without that, that, that poses a challenge um, with, with the schools closing. So one of the things that we had found through the interviews is making phone calls and using social media um, to connect with students virtually has been really helpful. And the phone calls don't necessarily need to be about the services, even just checking in on students, um, letting them know, hey, we're still here. How are you doing during this time? Um, that has been really crucial for sort of building rapport and letting students know, hey, we're, we're here, we're still here to help. Um, and, then they, and then they talk about services as relevant. Um, another strategy, um, so when, when calling, there are situations where calling might be less feasible. Um, maybe students don't have as much privacy as home and home. Um, uh, maybe there are certain hours that are a little bit more difficult. Um, we know that students are a little bit more reachable, for example, in the evenings and during the day. Um, and maybe privacy might be an issue. Uh, maybe if they receive a phone call, they may not feel really safe to talk about some sensitive reproductive health um, issues and concerns that they, that they want help with. So we also recommend um, and have found that setting up a phone line to allow students to reach the clinic at any time um, that was also a suggested strategy by those that we interviewed. Um, and uh, so clinics can sort of set up hotlines using a shared phone line. So for example, like Google Voice, um, and that allows students to reach out to clinic staff at their convenience. Um, and unlike sort of a traditional phone number, this hotline sort of allows multiple clinic staff to be on call sort of on a rotational basis. Um, and it can encourage students to call in real time to discuss any non-emergency health concerns and receive information they need. Um, and another item that I don't quite have on here is to upload videos to social media outlets and to educate students virtually on sexual reproductive health. So um, one of the things clinics have been doing is they're creating or sharing videos about reproductive health topics and uploading them to their social media platforms. And that's a way that they can provide ongoing health education to students. Um, and these patient education videos um, 
um, are, you know, are more likely to be effective and relatable if they involve the target content, uh, the target audience in the content creation process. So we found that folks have been doing that as well. Um, and then another thing, um, using uh, HIPAA compliant video conferencing platforms to ensure confidentiality and telehealth services is really important. It's also really important to kind of build trust, um, particularly with folks that are, are um, less comfortable with with kind of the video online setting and they want some security to know that, okay, is this information gonna be protected? What about the notes? Um, so um, there are a couple different platforms like Ring Central for Healthcare and others that provide confidential options to provide counseling that I think can help build some of that trust. Next slide. Um, another recommendation is to use apps and patient tools to improve contraceptive counseling experience for students and providers. So um, using an online patient-facing tool, for example, like bedsider.org, that can really increase students' comfort and familiarity with um, a wider range of contraceptive options. Um, clinics can also incorporate um, some counseling apps like HealthEU and Decide. Uh, decide plus to be ready. Um, and those apps provide students with information on different contraceptive options. Um, they can also use um, special tools such as uh, virtual patient waiting rooms, secure file sharing, client self-scheduling, all of these things to sort of mimic an in-person visit. Um, there are some platforms that offer automatic text message reminders. Um, and those for virtual visits are pretty easy um, to use and relatively inexpensive. Um, and then the last strategy is to dispense hormonal contraceptives in alternate locations or via pharmacy delivery. So um, you can still, you know, clinics that prescribe and dispense contraceptives on site, they can offer contraceptive counseling remotely, but then distribute birth control in alternate school spaces. So we definitely heard um, about birth control being distributed in, in school parking lots um, often. And um, clinics can also develop relationships with local pharmacies that offer delivery to facilitate access to students. And then we know not all school-based health centers prescribe contraceptives, but those, so those that don't um, can connect students with other providers. And there's several online uh, platforms such as Lemonade Pill Club and Virtuel. Um, happy to link all of these um, that allow patients to answer and take questions. Um, after which, then a nurse practitioner can virtually describe the hormonal contraceptives. Um, so that's just a quick overview of some of the strategies that we found through our lit literature review and through our interviews um, that folks are already using uh, to, to address family planning needs of these underserved populations during this time. Thank you. Great, thank you. And I'll turn it right now over to Paula. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I'm excited to be here and talk about how we can work together to support students across confidentiality requirements, regardless of schools in person or virtual or a combination of. Today, I'll share some examples from the field and what that makes possible for students. And I'll first say as a nurse, I started in school-based health centers a couple of decades ago, as Sarah shared earlier, and I still remain a fierce advocate for school-based health care because I've seen what it makes possible. From when I was a, a nurse seeing a student who come in and told me a frog peed in his eye, and I thought, oh gosh, is he, you know, telling me a story? And when I look at the eye, it's definitely impacted. And um, it ended up being a toxin from the, the it was a toad's parotid gland and it was urgent but the grandparent couldn't come and get them to get health care so we connected back to that primary care provider and an eye specialist to get that care so reducing barriers to my own son who is called needing care and his father and I were out of town for work and that's what happens when we work together and why I remain a fair advocate. Um, let me tell you a little bit about HIP and FERPA and how um, we've seen examples of working across both to support students. And my goal is to give you some ideas uh, in hopes that it will spark um, some, some ideas whenever you're working with and within such circumstances where you have to cross both HIPAA and FERPA. So I work at the School-Based Health Alliance in Washington, DC, and we work to improve the health of children and youth by advancing and advocating for school-based health care. And the reason I'm here is we believe that all children and adolescents deserve to thrive, but many struggle because they lack access to healthcare services. 
And Sarah already touched a little bit about the growth of school-based health centers. And I think one of the, the biggest things I would point out is we have school-based health centers in about 48 of 50 states, DC and Puerto Rico. Um, we didn't identify any in North Carolina, or, or sorry, North Dakota or Wisconsin, but we, we expect that to change. The census is a couple years old. It's on pause this year for COVID, but the biggest message is we serve about 10% of students, so there's a lot of room to grow. So we hope one of the things you take away is that spark if, if that's something that's needed in your area. So school-based health centers are in a unique position at the intersection of health and education. We're working across HIPAA and FERPA can create confidentiality confidentiality and privacy issues. And today let's talk about um, working together despite HIPAA and FERPA. So whenever um, I move on to um, what is HIPAA, and um, very, very broadly, HIPAA is the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act that started in 96. And it's created for protection of our privacy and it's for healthcare providers or health plans that transmit um, information in electronic format. Most schools don't fall under entities, but uh, under covered entities because HIPAA uh, intentionally excluded them because they fall under something called FERPA we're gonna talk about. Uh, most school-based health centers do fall under HIPAA. So that's just a broad what HIPAA is. Whenever we go to the next slide and talk about what FERPA is, that's the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act of 90 or of 74. It's been around a while. And that's the federal law that protects the privacy of students. It applies to educational agencies and institutions that receive funds from any programs administered through the US Department of Education. In general, FERPA, parents have access to the education records of their emancipated minor or child. And this includes health information contained in those electronic health records. So there's a little bit of the difference. On the next slide, it's more of just a graphic to show you what happens when HIPAA and FERPA comes together. Without a signed consent to share information across healthcare and education, you can't share much except in emergencies. And we'll dive a little bit deeper in that. And with so many rules involved, and with some of them appearing to conflict or overlap with one another, how can we make sense of this? So when you look at the next slide, we outline three areas, three different opportunities or areas for collaboration and coordination between school-based health centers and education around consent with limited sharing, consent with expanded information sharing, and then the bigger umbrella around memorandums of understandings and data sharing agreements. So let's look at the first one. Whenever you look at consents on the next slide, the first is the most limited sharing when the school-based health center has a consent, but it doesn't include information for sharing information with and across disciplines. It's restricted to incident-based sharing, such as mandating reporting of abuse, policy of violation of around violence, threats of harm, some emergencies, and confirmation that a student has or kept an appointment. School-based health centers can also collaborate with school nurses on select chronic and communicable diseases with just a general consent. But if you take that consent to the next level, and on the next slide, the Alliance worked with the National Association of School Nurses to see how we might work together better. And the result includes a recommendation for a school-based health center consent that includes bi-directional information sharing, meaning that we can share information um, between the people that's listed in there. So um, when we look at the consent and the language to share information with select school staff and primary care providers on a need to know basis, it's not that that information isn't confidential anymore, it's still confidential, but think of it as one service doesn't replace another. A school-based health center doesn't replace a school nurse or, a med or their medical provider or primary care provider. A school-based health center counselor doesn't replace a school social worker or counsel counselor, but instead of working together, we better support students by working to address those non-academic barriers because schools can't be expected to address all the students' needs alone. So that's the second way and it uh, allows for more sharing. There's examples of bi-directional information sharing consent wording that's available if that's something that's needed. You don't have to reinvent that. But the third way, which is on the next yeah, that I get even more excited about is a systems approach. It allows larger groups to collaborate to work towards student success. I've seen that happen and there's multiple examples and I'll highlight just a few. 
um, through a data sharing agreement. Statewide networks in New Mexico and Colorado utilize a data hub to bring together health and education data to answer questions around processes and outcomes to drive improvement. Alameda uh, County Schools and the University of California, San Francisco worked together to look at outcomes by working through a strong MOU. They found that school-based health centers um, increase access to health care and preventative services, and they improve the students' behavioral, out health, oh, behavioral health outcomes and improvements in academic success. And that's pretty big when you're looking at working together how to best support the students. And one last example that I might share is in Ohio where the State Department of Education and their State Department of Public Health Health work together to match state education and um, um, they work together through an interagency work group to match student IDs with Medicaid IDs to compare health and academic related metrics for the purpose of evaluating academic and health outcomes. Their work demonstrates that school-based health centers have a measurable impact on student health and academic outcomes such as attendance and proof. So those are some examples of when you think from the student level and bi-directional information sharing and the consent through the larger, um, more of a public health lens focus, what's possible and how we can help drive and improve student outcomes through working together and figuring out how to work across HIPAA and FERPA as a team. Great, thank you so much, Paula. That was very um, informative and those were some terrific examples. I'm sure that if folks are interested, they can follow up with you and the um, School Based Health Alliance more as well. So I'm gonna turn it now over to Sarah Jonas, who's going to be sharing some insights out of the New York City Community Schools. Wonderful, thank you, Sarah. So I'm excited to talk a little bit to you about how community schools supports this effort around whole child health and wellness and the role that uh, community-based organizations and partnerships can play to support integrated student supports and whole child wellness in community schools. So I'm going to start with a little bit of background about community schools in New York City. We ground the work in uh, core beliefs, which I'm going to share briefly with you now because I think they underscore the approach uh, that is supportive of whole child supports. So we believe that children bring their whole selves to school and therefore we need a strategy that wraps around the whole child. We also believe that schools are built on relationships and so community schools are committed to making sure that all children and all families feel connected in school and experience a sense of belonging. We believe that no single team or agency alone can provide this type of whole child support, with thus the uh, focus in community schools on community partnerships to, and partners to support this work. And we believe that each of our communities are filled with assets, relationships, and resources that can be leveraged and must be leveraged for student success. And you see a little bit at the bottom here that our Office of Community Schools supports a variety of uh, work streams that together support the whole child. And I'll talk a little bit more of some of these in a moment. So what are community schools? In New York City, we define community schools as a core component of a much broader equity strategy to organize resources and share leadership so that academics, health, youth development, and family engagement are integrated into the fabric of schools. And all of this works to support the right students getting the right supports at the right time. So while all uh, schools and community schools are different, they all share in New York City these four core evidence-based features. And they are collaborative leadership and practice, family and community empowerment, expanded learning time, and wellness and integrated student supports, which we'll spend a little bit more time on in a moment. But just to speak briefly to the other three, Collaborative leadership and practice, that speaks to the partnership between the school and the community-based partners and organizations that support the students and families in partnership with the principal, teachers, and school staff. Every community school, as we'll talk about in a moment, is paired with a lead community-based organization partner, and that partner hires a full-time community school director who works closely with the principal and school staff to connect families, students, and partners to the life of the school. 
Family and community empowerment speaks to the deep partnership in community schools, the shared leadership between families, communities, and the school. And some of the ways that this is lifted up in community schools are having families at the table in all key leadership decisions at the school and really helping to design both the vision for the school and the implementation of the community school programs and services. Expanded learning time relates to programs that take place before school, during school, after school, even on weekends and during the summer that support the core instructional program through additional whole child enrichments and partnerships. And again, we're going to spend and go a little bit deeper into the wellness and integrated student supports today. So as I mentioned a moment ago, every community school is partnered with a lead community-based organization. And we'll talk a little bit in a moment about what those specific services and supports look like. But again, the idea is that the full-time community school director focuses on this integration and this partnership with the school so that all of the programs and services that support the whole child are aligned to the broader goals of the school and support children in their learning and success. And the Office of Community Schools develops and manages a range of partnerships and programs to support this work, which we'll talk more about in a moment. So just a few examples, because I think this is an important point about the role of the community school director. So when we talk about the community partners being um, really embedded in the life of the school and how critical that is to uh, the provision of uh, supportive services and integrated student supports, these are some examples of what that looks like. So the community school director serves on the principal's cabinet and is really at the table for all of the key conversations in the school about the goals and the vision um, and the, uh, the metrics around student success. So that the community school director is helping not only to uh, contribute to those conversations, but also be able to hold that in, in his or her mind when they are working with community partners to help align community partners in the community school around a common vision uh, and a common, common set of goals and outcomes for, for students. The community school director is also in these conversations able to bring the voice of community partners into that work, uh, as well as the resources and assets of the community to bring to bear on the goals of the school for student success. So just a quick slide to show the scale and the scope of community schools in New York City. So you can see here that the community schools initiative uh, got underway in New York City in 2014-15 with 45 community schools. And we've expanded over the last five and a half years to our current 266 community schools. So we are currently the largest community schools initiative in the country. And we partner with over 60 community-based organizations in those schools. So uh, earlier this year, the RAND Corporation uh, um, published their study called Illustrating the Promise of Community Schools, which found that this approach to whole child supports and community partnerships in our schools in New York City is working. The study showed that students were more likely to graduate on time in community schools, miss fewer days of school, and that math scores improved, and that students felt safer and more supported in community schools. So a little bit about integrated supports in New York City community schools. So when we think about these supports, um, it's important to sort of um, ground this. I know on the webinar, we talked about some examples like the school-based um, cl uh, health clinics and so forth, and we'll go a little bit deeper into those in a moment and what that looks like in community schools. But across community schools, we uh, come to this as an approach to address out-of-school barriers to learning through partnerships with social and health service agencies and providers. And again, these are all coordinated and aligned by the community school director. These partnerships help students attend school more regularly and engage in learning through the provision of programs, including social emotional learning, health, conflict resolution training, and restorative justice. And all of these work in tandem to support overall health and mental health, to decrease conflict and bullying, as well as to decrease punitive disciplinary actions, including suspensions. So it's part of a broader effort um, for whole child positive outcomes. Services in community schools must include the creation of a school wellness council, as well as the coordination of vision screenings and physical health ser services, including reproductive health services for high school students. In partnership with the Department of Health and Warby Parker, Community schools provide free vision screening and prescriptive glasses to students who need them. 
And the services also include the creation of school linked partnerships to support community health needs through the provision of services on site at the school, as well as the development of referral pathways. And again, in all of this, the community school director is helping not only to coordinate across the various partners and make sure that everyone is aligned and sort of pointing in the same direction, but also helps to connect the school staff to the providers and partners and to connect students and families to the services providers and the school. So kind of serving to align and coordinate across the various partners, the families and the school staff to ensure that services are seamless um, and that uh, there's seamless service delivery across, across the school and students and families. So in a moment, I'll speak more specifically to the school-based health centers and mental health services, as well as the dental programs, but just a little bit more on some of the programs um, that you see here. So again, as I mentioned ago, a moment ago, we have a partnership to provide uh, free glasses to all students. So every student in a community school uh, uh, is screened, and if they need glasses, they receive a free pair of glasses. And we combine the vision screenings and optometry in the same visit. So again, trying to sort of maximize um, and support students with this type of service. You can also see on this page success mentoring. I wanted to lift this up because this is also part of our integrated student supports program. Success mentors are paired with students who are chronically absent. They are a caring adult who works with the student to help uncover the barriers students are facing, which might include health barriers as well, with coming to school on time each day. Success mentors work with the community school director and the school team to address these barriers and to help connect students uh, to supports in the school and activities that help to engage the child and support their strengths and interests. And you can also uh, see on here a little bit about the reproductive um, health services, just the last one I'd speak to on, on here, is around, um, I mentioned a moment ago, our CATCH program. This is a program that provides uh, for the 70% of high school teens in schools not served by school-based school-based health centers, these programs provide timely, easily accessible reproductive health services through the Office of School Health. And lastly, um, as we move into the next piece, I'll just lift up that we also, as I mentioned a moment ago, we partner um, with additional partners to provide services for our most vulnerable students and families. And this includes a partnership with the Floating Hospital, which provides medical, dental, and mental health services to all families in temporary housing even if they are unable to pay for the services or are undocumented. So here's a little bit about what uh, school-based health centers and mental health clinics um, look like in community schools. So currently we have 75 school-based health centers across our community schools. These provide health services such as the physical exams, vaccinations, as well as mental health services. Uh, all of our school-based health centers are operating as Article 28 clinics and they do not bill parents or students for the programs. All of the services are provided free of charge to students. We have currently 87 school-based mental health clinics, and these provide individual and family treatment and crisis support in the school for students and their families. All of our uh, school-based mental health clinics are organized around a three-tiered model of service. And it's critical to note here that, uh, again, our community school directors work with students, families, and partners to help, not only to help ensure that there are um, clear pathways to the supports and services, but also to help um, support and remove any stigma associated with um, students and families accessing these services. As far as the dental programs, we currently have 180 dental programs in community schools that provide both preventive and restorative services, including exams, cleanings, and fluoride treatment. And again, there's no cost to the families who receive this care. And we, we spoke a little bit earlier on, the, um, on, on this webinar about the impact of COVID-19. So I just wanted to lift up here the critical role that community schools have played during COVID. Uh, we've seen across our community schools how this approach to partnerships and, and building trust with students and families has really paid off as far as community schools being able to step quickly in to pivot, adapt, and support the emerging needs of students and families during COVID-19. So one example here is that one of our community school directors started a weekly Wellness Wednesdays call, a virtual call for families of middle school students. And this became a place where families could share not only challenges that they were facing with supporting their child's uh, social emotional well-being and mental health, but be able to network with one another to share practices and strategies 
um, also to share and support um, with the school staff as well as other partners. So it really became a space um, that was very well received to the point where originally it was offered one day a week as a Wellness Wednesday. And because of the success, families actually requested that these calls happen several times a week and not just once a week because the need was there and the ability to support one another and create these networks to support uh, student and child well-being was so critical. And again, the community school director, because of those trusting relationships, was able to set up and support this resource uh, in an ongoing way for students and families. Wonderful. Well, thank you, everyone, for those terrific presentations. Um, we do have time for questions, and we've been getting some in the chat. So um, some of them I can already tell are for specific panelists. So I will be reading the questions and then asking for folks to unmute uh, themselves. Um, if more questions come up, please keep posting them. Um, we'll do our best to answer all we can in the next um, 10 or 12 minutes or so. Okay, great. So um, the first question um, I'll direct to Janita. Do you know if those apps you referenced are available in multiple languages? Um, that's a good question. There are some that are more kind of friendly towards multiple languages than others. Let me go ahead and um, link them all in the chat um, so that you guys can see them. And are these apps, um, referring to apps, are, are we talking about um, apps uh, for increasing, increasing familiarity with contraceptive options or are we talking about the, con the counseling apps or I'll, I'll link all of them, but um, yeah, I know that's better. Okay. Great, thank you. Yeah, I'll, sure. So the next question I'll direct toward Paula. Paula, there were a couple of them here. So the first one I will ask, um, is there a sample draft of an MOU available to assist with some of these HIPAA for HIPAA collaboration strategies? And I'll just go ahead and ask the second. Um, of the video platforms, um, do you happen to know which ones are HIPAA compliant? So I'll leave both of those to you. Good questions. We do have a resource available around developing an MOU and the key components that you would want to include in the MOU. Um, it is available on our website through the blueprint that went public yesterday. It had been a member only resource and if not, feel free to connect and I'll, I'll get that to you. The second question, do I know what um, platforms are HIPAA compliant? And there, there are lists, and I can, I can put a, say a few, but a DoxyMe, there is a Zoom HIPAA compliant. Um, and uh, if they want to follow up with an email, we can provide a comprehensive list. But I, a quick Google search can also, I think, yield the same result. Of interest, there were states that waived um, some of the requirements initially. And uh, whenever we look at HIPAA compliant platforms, I think as we move forward and hope to see continuation of the availability of telehealth and telehealth reimbursement become very important that we um, provide uh, that care through a HIPAA compliant platform at all times. Great, thank you. This one I'm going to direct toward um, Sarah. So Sarah, um, can you speak a little bit to how um, community schools are funded? Sure. Um, so in New York City, community schools are funded through a range of funding sources, including uh, tax levy uh, funding, as well as grants such as uh, uh, state and federal funds, such as 21st Century Community Learning Centers, um, as well as uh, we leverage funding, other types of after school funding uh, supports as well. Um, so I can share more information um, sort of on some of the specifics, but it's really a range of funds. We also use attendance improvement and dropout prevention funding. So those first 45 schools that you saw in the first year were funded through attendance improvement and dropout prevention. So it's really this approach of blending and braiding various funding streams to support the work and continue to grow the work. Great. Okay. I think I'm going to piggyback on that with if you could talk about what an Article 28 clinic is. Um, sure. I can speak um, briefly to that and then um, there may be others who have even uh, more expertise than I do, but um, all of our school-based health centers, as I mentioned, operate as Article 28 clinics. Uh, this means that they're um, independent institutions 
um, usually partnered with either, um, in our case, they're you know, obviously community-based and partnered within a school setting. Um, and so for each of these uh, school-based health centers, we partner with a provider um, that partners with the school to offer the programming um, in, you know, directly in the school for all students and, uh, and families um, who are actually you know, students of that particular school. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, these programs don't bill students or, or uh, parents or students. They provide um, the services free of charge to students regardless of insurance or immigration status. Um, these, uh, the school-based health centers bill the insurance when the parents provide the information. Um, I can say as well that um, you know in these in these uh, in the school-based health centers, part of the job of the uh, community school director and partner is to um, help uh, you know ensure that any student or family that is eligible for health insurance you know help to sign up those students and families for um, for health insurance um, you know and help make those connections there as well. Yeah, I can speak a little bit not to this, to the different funding strategies, and I know Paula can as well. There are a whole variety of ways that school-based health centers specifically can, um, you know, can get funding. I mean, there are, um, you know, they bill students insurance, um, and a lot of these clinics are also associated with federally qualified health centers, so they get those higher reimbursement rates. Um, I can also say in the number of clinics that those students, and so I'm specific, I'm speaking specifically to um, to West Virginia. I know Paul, let's speak to more broadly, but um, many states, because of the Affordable Care Act, were able to expand um, CHIP and well Medicaid, and then CHIP also fills that gap with low-income um, children as well. So I know in West Virginia, we have very few students who aren't covered by health insurance, fortunately. And so, but in many clinics, those students who, those few students who fall through the cracks, I will say like with Sarah's clinics, they don't wind up billing the families. And so there are, the, are there are models where, you know, you, the priority is to get the care to the children and not to, um, you know, to, to provide, you know, to send bills and collections to the, to the parents as well. But um, Paula, do you want to add anything to that about these different funding streams or strategies? Sure. When you look at um, the national census feedback, it, the funding for school-based health centers are diverse and it varies from school health center to school health center, as Sarah shared. Federally, we see about half of the school-based health, or nationally, we see about half of the school-based health centers funded by federally qualified health centers who receive 330 funding to provide the healthcare safety net and get the higher rate of reimbursement. We also see um, uh, billing through Medicaid and CHIP reimbursement at the state and federal level. And then at the local level, there's a lot of foundations and private institutions that provide dollars, as well as hospitals who will bring their some of their community benefit dollars to the table. And education that brings often facilities or assistance with utilities that you don't always think of when you think of the, the, the whole the whole picture of what it costs to have a school health center and not so much um, to make a profit because that's not what happens in school-based health centers, but it's how you can keep the lights on so you can keep serving students. Right, and there are often, there are referrals to the parent clinic or the parent hospital as well. You know, there's other ways to connect um, children to other services as well. And um, back to their primary care provider and that coordination or connection with the PCP when the school-based health center isn't one, and that varies also from site to site. Well, and I will say, especially during COVID, the relationships between the parent, you know, clinic organization and the school-based health centers has been really important, especially during the telehealth time, because um, they've been able to, you know, they're in the same database or they have those medical records and they've been able to, um, in, in many cases, maintain those connections. Um, oh dear, we're running out of time. There's many good questions. Um, I wonder um, if anyone wants, there are a few questions about nutrition. Um, Sarah, I wonder if you have any um, programs or um, any of your community schools specifically focus on nutrition or gardening or anything like that. Yeah, um, absolutely. And during COVID, um, the issue of food insecurity obviously has been top of mind in community schools. So, um, you know, pre-COVID, yes, we definitely have community schools that have community gardening programs um, that have um, 
uh, you know, kind of uh, farmers markets types of programs, and as well as um, partnerships specifically to address food insecurity. So during COVID, we've seen community schools um, step in and, uh, you know, create sort of uh, within community schools, we have food pantries in many of our schools. During COVID, some of those had to when schools were closed, for example, over the, uh, you know, in the spring, community schools were able to move those pantries off-site through community partnerships. So, for example, partnering with faith-based institutions or others, um, and as well as to deliver food directly to families through partnerships with like local grocery stores um, and other, um, you know, kind of food sources to make sure that they were able to get food to the families that needed it the most. Great, thank you. I know there's been other, uh, many other strategies um, looking into um, and trying to serve children's nutritional needs around these times as well, including buses delivering packages and, and things like that. Um, so I realize we're almost up against the hour and we do have a few um, poll questions we want to follow up on and just a few final slides. So I know that Emily has been posting these, but here are some recent blogs and publications related to the topics we've discussed today. And I know the School-Based Health Alliance has some additional information um, that they posted and, and there's some more um, information you can find um, on various websites as well. And here's the um, New York City Community Schools link as well. Um, and so um, I will let Emily launch these polls um to I, I think they're working <laughs> my webcam just went away so i can't really tell um emily if you want to unmute and, and take this over as well um but if you could just uh first question would you recommend this webinar to a colleague i'll just give that a few seconds Okay, um, did you learn something new today that you could apply to your work supporting health in schools? Again, just take a minute to do that. Okay, great. And the last question, what other topics related to supporting health in schools would you like to learn more about? Please use the question box to respond to this one. Again, this is our school health week, but it just so happens earlier today, I was speaking with other colleagues at Child Trends and we're planning on partnering with other organizations to likely do another series of these um, after, during the new year, acknowledging uh, more changes with regard to um, you know, COVID and schools and hopefully our um, new uh, vaccine regimen. So, um, Please, um, please share those, your, your specific requests now um, as we start to plan for those too. And all webinar slides and additional links will also be shared after the webinar. And I just want to thank all of you for showing up today to this important topic. I want to thank our other wonderful panelists um, from Child Trends, from the School-Based Health Alliance, and from New York City Community Schools, Junita and Paula and Sarah. Thank you so much for, for coming out today. On behalf of Child Trends and all these other organizations, we're very grateful for your interest on this important topic. Please feel free to reach out to any of us. We will be happy to share additional resources to answer questions to the extent we're able and um, to keep moving the field of school uh, health coordination, community school co coordination as well. And I hope you all have a wonderful day. Thank you very much.